The new covenant and the transition from Sabbath to Lord's Day, putting deeper meaning into Sunday worship. The text that Pastor Chris read, Romans 14, 1 to 9, it's a pretty involved text, and it's a pretty strange text. What are we going to make of the words? What are we going to do with verse 5? One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. What does that mean? First of all, that last sentence is, is really a strange sentence. You would think, you would think it would read like this. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike, each one should be tolerant of the other's view. Wouldn't that fit better? And yet he seems to say the exact opposite. Each one, make sure you are absolutely convinced of your view. Don't change. Be fully persuaded that what you are saying is right. And you would think that would just be the opposite of what he would say. There's all these different opinions. Don't be so rigid. Be flexible. But he doesn't say that, does he? There's all sorts of different views. Make sure you are absolutely firm in your conviction. Fully persuaded. Does this text teach that only weak Christians will take diligence to honor the Lord's day? Is that what Paul means? Does this text teach that all days are basically the same and that each person can decide when and how he will set time aside to worship the Lord? Is that what this text teaches? How important is Sunday? Is there abiding scriptural meaning to the concept of the first day of the week being the church's day of corporate worship? Is it still the Lord's day? Is that when we worship? I have four points that I want us to consider together. We'll do two this Sunday. And we'll do two next. Let me tell you now, just so you don't think I'm even more asleep at the switch than usual. Let me tell you now that we won't really get into the Romans 14 text until next week. I'm only introducing it. We will get to it. But I want to work my way into it. So we'll come back to Romans 14 at the close of these two teachings. At this point, it simply highlights the kind of questions that that I think are relevant to the church, the questions we're going to be studying. Before we come to answer the questions, let's take a fairly detailed look because I think there is so much confusion in the body of Christ on the biblical teaching on the Sabbath, the Old Testament teaching on the Sabbath, and then the Lord's Day and the particular meaning and importance of each. So that's what we're going to do. Point number one, the foundational significance of the Sabbath was the setting forth of a visible witness that there was one true God who was the creator of all things. One true God who was the creator of all things. So, biblical revelation did not enter a vacuum in this world. There were competing religious stories. There were competing myths. There were competing systems of worship. So then, as now, there were competing truth claims. Things said about God. How shall the Christian truth claims proceed? Where do we start? What makes divine revelation that is true, what makes it different? I have two texts. Exodus chapter 20, 8 through 11. You'll know these words. 
The second text is going to be in Exodus 31. We'll get to it. Those words aren't known quite as well. Here's the Exodus 20 uh, text in the context of the Ten Commandments, and this is where we usually frame our understanding of the Sabbath, which is fine as long as you just understand it's a starting point for understanding the Sabbath, not the whole picture. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock. Wow. You keep your dog from running on the Sabbath. Or the sojourner, the visitor. You got your in-laws, you have somebody visiting. Nobody does any work. Okay, why? For, there's the reason. Because... In six days, the Lord made, there's the creation part, the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 and 13. This is a recap, but with a different emphasis. And the Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, see those words? So we know that what's coming has to be important, right? Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths for, this is a sign. Now, that's interesting. It's not the reality, it's, it's the sign pointing to something else. The big deal isn't the Sabbath just for the sake of the Sabbath. It's like, it's like when you're driving on the 401 and you see Don Valley Parkway North, the significance of it isn't the sign, it's if you're going that way, you got to get on the ramp. It's what the sign points to, okay? Above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths for... This is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you, may, that you may know. So there's something that they need to know, but they won't know it without this. That you may know, they might know it up here, but they won't know it the way they're supposed to know it, that I, the Lord, sanctify you. So there's those two pretty important texts. It's true that the first mention of Sabbath isn't in these texts. It's found in the feeding with manna, the journey of Israel. But these texts in Exodus 20 and 31, they explain the Sabbath in terms of ongoing law and meaning. The reasons for the Sabbath are unpacked in greater detail here. God creates six days and he rests on the seventh. Now, of course, he doesn't rest in order to worship because he has no one to worship. We do. He doesn't. So our rest isn't exactly like his, but just as God said to Moses, the creation of the world by the one true God, that's the Exodus 20 text, the creation of the world by the one true God, it receives a permanent witness through the rhythm and completion of six days plus one, seven. Now, if you want proof of that, the witness to creation, six days plus one, seven, that you may know that I am the God who created heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in it. If you want proof of that, consider the fact that we still have weeks. 
that shouldn't be just rushed over without thought. We have days because that's how long it takes the earth to revolve once on its axis. We have months because that's how long it takes the moon to orbit the earth. We have years because it takes a year for the earth to complete one orbit around the sun. Why do we have weeks? There's nothing specific in the realm of astronomy that coincides with or mandates precise weeks. You can Google this. Google this and you'll find all sorts of references to the fact that the creation account in the opening chapters of Genesis is the only solid reason for the presence of weeks in the keeping of time. We think in terms of weeks because God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. Seven days. To me, that's fascinating, that, that every time some atheist says, I'm going to Florida in two weeks, he's pointing to the creating activity of our God, and he doesn't even know it. We are separating the God who created the world and all that is in it from the false gods and the idols that clutter and dominate the religions of the world. Weeks point to creation, and creation points to a creator. But why the pause? I get the seven days. Why did God rest on the seventh day? And what kind of rest was it? Last summer, while we were on holidays, Rini and I went to a church not that far from here, and the pastor was doing an illustrated sermons, and it was on, of all subjects, the keeping of the Sabbath. And the pastor came out dressed in keeping with his topic. He was dressed in casual cargo shorts, he had sandals, he had a, a, a Leafs jersey. And he was trying to make the point that we were all stressed out. And so he had this little backpack and he kind of slung it down on the floor. There was no pulpit. And he started taking things out of the bag. He took out a cell phone. He took out a Blackberry. He took out a shopping list. He took out a bundle of credit cards. All these things, obviously, that, that make our lives hectic and fast-paced. And these... We were told he had a Coke, he was drinking it, and we were told that all these things were bringing stress and bondage. And to free us from all these, God has given us a precious gift, a day to kick back, a day to catch a fresh breath, a day to rest from our mad commercialism and our material pursuits. And if we ignore this day, we will either burn out or we will at least start to fray around the edges so the Sabbath is God's gift. And that was it. Rest. Relax. Take a God-ordained break. These things stress us out, and we can't live well stressed out. And God gave the Sabbath to de-stress these busy lives of ours. Sabbath is for inward regrouping. It's a peaceful pause to ward off burnout. You can't just rev the engine too long without a God-given pause. And get no argument from me on any of that. I mean, it's true as far as it goes. But it's tragically incomplete, and I'm going to argue in the rest of this message and next that there's a strange kind of reverse legalism. I'll explain that in a minute. 
there's a strange kind of reverse legalism in terms of what the Bible teaches about the theology and the fulfillment-oriented nature of the Old Testament Sabbath day. I'm saying that the kind of rest we need is not just a physical break. The kind of rest we need is a day that teaches and a day that trains us to live different lives. Not merely a pause that lets us go back to the same kind of lifestyle all over again, but 31.13 of Exodus. This is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you'll know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. We should know this. We should know this deeply. We should know it from the scriptures themselves. I mean, did God really rest on the seventh day because he was just tired? Did God sit down on the seventh day, just plunk down somewhere under a big tree and go, man, am I bushed. If I have to do one more mountain, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, no. The creation account tells us that God pondered his own works on the seventh day in a way that would be highly egotistical for any other being in the universe. God looked at the sheer grace and power and goodness in his own person. God admired his own glory on the seventh day. And that's our Sabbath calling. We fill our minds with the mighty, gracious, all-powerful creator. We mentally separate him from all non-creating, non-redeeming gods and objects of worship in this world. And that, my friends, is why the world is filled with weeks that end with the seventh day. That's what those weeks give testimony to. The Sabbath was never given just so we would have a chance to chill and rest so we could return to our mad pursuit of self with new energy. It was given to change the way we think altogether. If there's anything the Bible makes clear about the Sabbath, it's this. Now, for obvious reasons, there are verses we quote far less often, but which help make crystal clear the Sabbath was never given for our own leisure and our own pleasure. The prophet Isaiah thundered about this. Isaiah chapter 58 13 and 14. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing, from doing, see these words? Your pleasure on my holy, here's the words we're meant to see the contrast in. Your and my, right? Your pleasure on my holy day. And call the Sabbath a delight and a holy day of the Lord, honorable, if you honor it, not going about your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. Oh, there it is. What is the Sabbath for in the Old Testament? It's for, for cultivating a delight in God. It won't just happen. It won't just happen. It takes time. Take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So, so the Sabbath was given not primarily just to recharge, but to sanctify. That you'll remember, uh, Exodus 31, that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Not to recharge, but 
to sanctify. And those aren't the same thing. The Sabbath isn't for our own ways, Isaiah 58, 13, or our own pleasure, 13. So, here's where we're going. These Old Testament passages fit together when you take them all together. And here's what we've seen so far. We haven't finished, but here's what we've seen so far. In the words given to Moses, I'm still talking Old Testament now. God wants to sanctify the people. He wants to remind them that he's the creator, the one true God. He wants them to learn, Isaiah, to take delight in the Lord. And he wants them to realize that they will take delight in the Lord when they take one day in seven and turn from their own pleasures. But we're still not done. In fact, in terms of understanding the purpose of the Old Testament Sabbath, let me just tell you up front. We haven't yet come to the most important thing the Old Testament says about the Sabbath. We're not there yet. The most important thing. To remind us of the Creator, to sanctify us, to teach us to delight in God, and not to delight in ourselves. To teach us that. But there's another dominant theme coming out of the Old Testament Sabbath that's even more central to us as Christians as it relates to the establishment of the Lord's Day in the New Testament. So point number two. Are you all with me? Okay. Okay, this is one of those long points that everybody laughs at me for. But they mocked Jesus too, so I'm... I'm After establishing the proportions, that's the important word. After establishing the proportions of one day in seven to know our Creator God and become sanctified. Okay, so that's what we've been looking at. After that, the central theme of the Old Testament Sabbath is further sharpened. Please understand this. This is the nature. This is the nature of what's called progressive revelation in the Scriptures. Doesn't mean that The New Testament is true and the Old Testament is false. It doesn't mean that at all. It's all God's Word. But what it does mean is things are unfolded and unpackaged. Progressive revelation. God takes us by the hand and He leads us deeper once we have grasped earlier revelations of His will and way. And the earlier revelations become preparatory for Complete understanding. That's the important sentence. Earlier revelations become preparatory for complete understanding. That's progressive revelation. And that's what I meant when I said earlier that that well-intentioned pastor's comments on that summer Sunday were a kind of reverse legalism. And by that I mean... It was legalism that doesn't really feel like legalism because his words didn't have that command, prohibition kind of ring to them that we associate with legalism. But it was legalism nonetheless because he was taking that bare rest instruction and separating it from its fulfillment teaching in the rest of the Old Testament and the New Testament. He took... He took a departure point as a destination. Does that make sense? Instead of following through and seeing where that point was leading. That's what we're doing now. Deuteronomy chapter 5. I was talking to another pastor friend of mine in a pretty large church, and I told him I was doing this for two Sundays, and he told me I was nuts. I said, they're used to that. (laughs) Deuteronomy 5, starting at verse 12. This sounds like Deuteronomy literally means second law. It's, 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 It's the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20 restated and explained. It's like a sermon 
on the original giving of the Ten Commandments. That's what the word Deuteronomy means. So verse 12, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Nothing new there. Six days you shall labor, do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. And you've heard this before. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your ox, your donkey, any of your livestock, the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. Now this part becomes the heart. You shall remember, this is what, what are they going to do on the Sabbath? That you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Remember that? And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, there's the reason the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Therefore, this is why. Why? Well, it's a day to remember. Remember what? That the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You were captives. So we've already considered the not pursuing their own pleasure instruction. Why not? Is God against people having fun? What were they to do while they weren't pursuing their own ways? Where were their minds to go? What kind of transformation was taking root in their minds over weeks and weeks and weeks of remembering the Sabbath? Well, fortunately, we aren't left to guess. We get it in that 15th verse of Deuteronomy 5. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. We're told they were to cease other activities. So that they could give their full undivided attention to something else. And if they didn't stop everything else, they wouldn't remember what they needed to remember. They would be distracted. Transformation would be impossible if their full attention wasn't given. Think about this. Transformation would be impossible if their full attention wasn't given one day in seven completely to something else, something different. So the Sabbath was for this shifted attention. The Sabbath was for this studying. The Sabbath was for this remembering. Remembering what? And why couldn't they remember it properly while they worked at other important things? Why can't we multitask? How many are good at multitasking? It's not a sin. I'm just asking how many. Let me tell you, no one is good at multitasking when it comes to these spiritual pursuits. Because what God requires is a single focus. What were they to remember? Why couldn't they remember it while they were still working at other important things? Because... They were to study and ponder and rehearse and celebrate God's delivering work out of Egypt on their behalf. All right? The not working was a way of vividly remembering that they didn't get out of Egypt through their own effort. Everybody see it? That's the bingo moment. Bingo. The rest isn't because I just need a break and boy am I tired and I, need, I just need to rest. Do that Saturday. This rest isn't for that purpose. This rest is a ceasing of work so that I can remember it wasn't my work 
that brought about my deliverance. And if I'm working while I try to remember the importance of not working, it's, 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 it's going to short circuit. It's at cross purposes. They were to remember that they were delivered by God's work, not their work. Hence, they were to cease from their own labor. This is the reason given for the break from their regular routine. It had nothing whatsoever to do with merely taking a break, like not going to work on Saturday. No. This day was God-designed to teach us learning about and knowing God takes time. This is where I want to go as we wrap up. Because I don't think the church actually believes this. I know if I said, do you agree, you would all nod. But in terms of heart agreement, my guess is there aren't ten people in the sanctuary that really agree with this. You can't know God with just a few minutes each day. And you can't know God while you're immersed in other legitimate, important activities. You can't know God that way. It takes undistracted concentration over time. You can't do it properly in an hour or two hours. And so what God does... Remember, we have weeks because of creation. What God does is right from the beginning, it says, you're going to need about one full day in seven if you want to know me. That's what it takes to remember. That's that's the mental leverage required to retrain and reorient my fallen, proud, self-reliant heart. It's a big job, and it takes much time. And so right from the creation of the world onward, we are forced with the lesson that we aren't as naturally, spiritually inclined as we think. It is not easy for us to savor and ponder and rehearse and relish and delight in God and grace. And so, after establishing the week's proportions, six work, one remembering, after establishing the proportions, God starts to state the purpose. Israel ponders deeply her deliverance. She ponders how her creator used creation itself. Who is a God like this? Turning water into blood. Frogs, the firstborn smitten, seas parting, forming a dry pathway to escape, a cloud and a pillar of fire to guide. Remember all this, God says. You can't do it on the golf course. You can't do it at the office. You leave everything aside so you can pour mental energy into this for extended periods of time because you won't know me without that. Israel ponders that she was smaller and she was weaker. She was nothing special. She could easily forget this. She forgot it even with the Sabbath observance. She forgot her Creator. She was delivered by God's work, not hers. That's the reason for turning from her own efforts on the Sabbath. She had done nothing to earn her deliverance. She needed the Sabbath to remember this. Then and now, we are all inclined to think that we are delivered by our own religious effort, our own piety. And so Israel needed, and we need, 
a forever day, a continuous reminder. We gather here today as a celebration that we have been redeemed by grace and not our purity and not our devotion and not our specialness. Grace is easier to sing about than it is to think about. It's incredibly hard to remain thoughtful about grace. Israel needed the Sabbath to remain thankful. Without this turning of attention to her delivering God, she would become like the nations all around her. She would have a belief in some God, to be sure, but she would remain, hear it, unsanctified in her thinking about her delivering God. And even when she did rest, and here's the problem with that pastor's message that summer Sunday, even when she did rest, she would consider that rest earned by all the work she had just accomplished, kind of like saving up for retirement. And just like that pastor in the church, how, 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 reading the text that we read, how do you talk about the Sabbath without one mention of redemption? How can that be? If you just take the Exodus 20 rest, just rest, and you stop right there and you fix your understanding there, it's exactly the same thing as taking the Old Testament teaching about sacrificing lambs and stopping there and never moving on to Jesus. Does everybody see that? That's what the Sabbath was about. It's about Jesus. No wonder when he was doing miracles and they got after him. Do you remember what Jesus said? We'll look at it next week. He said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I can do this. The Sabbath was always about me, he said. It was always about me. It's my day. Next Sunday, we'll focus on the biblical meaning of the shift to the Lord's day. I just scratched it a bit. Spend your Lord's day. It takes a day. It takes a day. That part hasn't changed. It's a day. One in seven. It takes the whole thing. Spend your Lord's day feeding your whole being with grasping and learning more deeply and savoring the atoning work of Jesus Christ that you don't get there with your own work. And do it with other redeemed sinners. I'll tell you why. I'm somewhat biased in my own favor when I look at my life, and so are you. And I can believe that God can work his grace in mighty ways in my life, but there's other people in this church, and I find it hard to believe that God could be gracious to them. Are you like that? Get together with the body of Christ because we need this constant reminder that just as surely as, as I am freely justified by his grace when I put my trust in Jesus Christ, the person who annoys me the most is also just as justified in Jesus Christ and an object of his love and grace. And you don't learn that kneeling by your bed in your devotional time. You learn that when you're confronted with a body of Christ where you get just enough irritation to stretch your belief in God's grace for other people. 